Thank you for listening to the Maker in the Mix podcast, where we discuss design, innovation, and all things concrete. Well, hopefully, uh, since I'm recording on my computer now this time, even though I'm sitting in my car because um, it's we got a lot going on in there. One of the yeah, guys is crowding, easy. the other one's uh, mm-hmm. making crates. So we got a lot uh, going on. So I'm sitting in the truck because it's uh, quieter. But I'm on my computer, so I should not have an issue with getting phone calls uh, during this podcast and getting right. <clears throat> getting the camera ruined. Um so welcome everybody to season two, episode three yep. of the Maker in the Mix. Welcome from well, for me it is uh, sixteen degrees, balmy sixteen degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is in Celsius. Cold, might. cold, cold. Uh, it's just below cold. zero. Yeah, right. it's cold. Um, for it for was, the south, uh, it's cold. For for the yeah. for our northern kin, um, not cold. Not so much. <laughs> Uh, it was it was below zero in center, in you know uh, Celsius. It was one uh, when I left the shop this morning or left the house this morning. Uh huh. Um, Chilly. Yeah. So, but unfortunately, we had which I I have kids, so I want snow. Um, and we like twenty minutes west of us. Yeah, I know Jeff doesn't like it. Twenty minutes west of us got four or five inches, and we got not the first flurry. Yeah. So it was weird. Um. But uh, today on season two, episode three, um, we've got an exciting, I think, uh, hopefully impactful episode. You know, the last few we've just been kind of shooting from the hip, which is always fun. Uh, I always enjoy it. But we decided to actually topicify it today. That's right. Uh, we so we're going to do some. We have a list. <laughs> we do we have a list. It will probably grow as we talk. But, um, yeah. but we're going to be talking about some tips and tricks. We've got seven uh, seven tips and tricks, um, just pieces of information that may help you in your day to day. Um, as I've got them, I got three business tips and we've got four concrete tips. So hopefully that will, um, help, uh, whatever you're going through or dealing with, or maybe it is pertinent on a project or maybe it will be sometime this year. So uh, I wanted Uh to, you know, kind of kick off with pearls of wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we want to, you know, this is not just about, us yammering on it's about us providing you value so certainly um you know in the future if any of you listeners have something that you'd like us to talk about specifically um always reach out we're we're more than available and excited and happy to do that um you know we've had a few people reach out and we've done topics uh, based on that and so we'd like yeah. to continue that um so definitely don't be shy hey this um, is this is an interactive yeah. you know exchange here um although yeah, it's for sure it's easy to and enjoyable to sit back and listen um, and and gather information, um, but it's it's nice to hear from you folks. Um, For sure, it lets us know that you're paying attention. Which you know we've been grateful to you know to hear from some people um, you know as we have mm-hmm. had uh, workshops etc. Um, so without further ado, uh, Jeff, you want to start with business or concrete? Um. Well, given the fact that it's cold for yeah. you and cold for me and cold for a lot of folks, let's talk a little bit about what, what that means to your business, to your production, to your schedule, to your customers. Um, Absolutely. Because it's not something that you can ignore, um, but it's also not something that is going to shut you down. It doesn't um, have to. It's and it could. we're talking in sort of broad brush strokes, so to speak, that apply to a lot of different situations. So, for instance, w- one of the things that's Im- always important to realize that when, when your shop is cold and your ingredients are cold and everything's cold, is chemical reactions slow down. Sure. And that applies to your concrete when it sets, how long does it take before it sets, uh, how quickly or how slowly does it gain strength, all that. It also in- impacts your sealer, uh, depending on what you sealer you're, you're using. Um, there are very few sealers who are that are not inf- influenced by temperature, and it's just something to be aware of. And so this is sort of um, independent of whether you use your own mix design or you're buying a bag mix or you're buying a- admixtures or what sealer you're using. 
everybody's affected by cold temperatures. Uh, maybe not the same, but they're all affected. So it's something to be really uh, uh, cognizant of. And if you're not set up for it, it can it can lead to some unpleasant surprises. Um, yeah, I mean, and and to to piggyback on that, you know, I mean, we can talk about what I do in my shop and maybe what mm -hmm. best practices would be. But um, you know, I Jeff anecdotally, he and I had talked about a uh, a grout issue I was having, and and this is the beauty of having you know. CCI kind of in your back pocket is I called Jeff and I said, look, I'm having a grout issue. And he went to work on verifying that, you know, weeding out potential factors. Um, turns out it was the cold. Um, despite my having heat up on in the shop, um, I was, ha you know, it was taking, taking extra long to, uh, to set up. And, um, you know, turns out it was the cold. I've used the exact same mix three times uh, since, and it's been fine. So, um, you know, cranking the heat up in my shop was the key. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so what I do, uh, and Jeff, what you do or did, uh, you know, do in your current shop and did in your production shop may be different than what I did, but, um, certainly in Florida didn't need much. It never got down to 16. Uh, I, I think high thirties was about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, thankfully now in my first shop, it was kind of a tin can. It was a uh, all metal building, no insulation, so it was unpleasant in the winter. And I remember, you know, times where we had to stick heaters in there and stuff. Um, in my second shop in Orlando, everything was very well insulated. So the shop never really got below 60. Um, and so, you know, and by the time it was 10 a.m., it was 75 again. Um, so I never really dealt with that in Florida. And so those of you in the Caribbean or in Florida or, you know, parts of Texas, you know, there, there are areas where you certainly don't deal with this. Um, but most places deal with this in some capacity. So what I've done in my shop um, is I've got two uh, 100,000 BTU um, linear like tube heaters. Uh, the, they're natural gas. Um, so it's essentially a, a flamethrower inside a tube. Um, and it's radiant. They're nice. heat, so They're <laughs> wonderful. Um, they're not cheap to run. But, um, you know, after two years of having them, the first winter I did without, and it was horrible. I mean, we had, you know, space heaters everywhere and it was kind of like, you know, there were days where we couldn't cast cause it was too cold or, you know, or, or we had to wait two or three days or whatever, mm -hmm. even though it's expensive to heat. Um, I definitely am an advocate for it because it makes, you know, the concrete process much more, I mean, you know, I think about, okay, well, maybe it cost me $800 a month to heat in the cold, cold months. Uh, but that $800 is well made up by the, <clears throat> the, you know, realistically days and sometimes weeks of time I would save by, right. you know, if I didn't have them. So, um, so I do that. Um, I keep my shop at about 60 degrees when I'm not there and about 65 to 70, depending on what I'm doing when I am there. If I've got new sealer, like if I just lay down sealer, I'm going to leave the heat at 70 and it's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, warm when I get in, but you know, I know it's going to cost and that's okay. Um, well, that's you know, the, the cost, cost of, of doing business, right? It is. And the cost of heating the slab from freezing is a hell of a lot more than the cost of heating it from 60. Right. Um, you know, so if I had to, if I let it just, if the heat just went off, for several mm -hmm. days, you know, it'd be 30 in the shop and then I'd have to, it'd have to run for three or four days continuously to heat the slab. Um, whereas now I've got a baseline, right? Um, you know, so that's, that's what I do. What, what did you do in, uh, in your, so production? like in my current, my, my current shop, which is really a research shop, um, because I don't the need lab. a big, it's a lab. It's a lab. It really is a lab. <laughs> um, I don't need thousands of square feet to do stuff because well i have your shop <laughs> yeah where, where we do that where we teach in a in a real shop so I, you know i'm fortunate in my past several shops have always been part of a bigger building a masonry building so the the temperatures are pretty moderate because of that um mm -hmm. i do keep the heat uh, i'm also very, very fortunate. I have not only do I have heat, but I have air conditioning, which is nice. <laughs> but it, I, I don't go to extreme. I don't try to keep it at like room temperature. So, like yesterday, yeah. I went in and cast some samples, and I hadn't been in in a shop for a while. And I usually keep the shop just at like fifty five degrees um, when I'm not there. Uh, 
So it's like, okay, I'm not going to do anything different. But when I'm, because I'm, I'm also trying to simulate what normal people shops are. Like it's just not economically reasonable or feasible to keep your shop above room temperature all the time. Right. That would just be prohibitively expensive. But, would, you know, yeah. shooting for low 60s, what's that in centigrade, like 16, 18 degrees, um, that's pretty reasonable. It's it's miserable to work in a shop that's where everything's really cold, right? So it's not just your concrete. It's, it's your ability to function and function well and want to be there and be efficient. So that's a, that's a pretty reasonable uh, number. So what I do is, although I do turn the heat up a little bit, um, while, while the concrete's curing, I like, I literally set it at 65. Um, mm -hmm. and the thermostats in a, in a different part of the shop where the casting area is closer to, there's like an area that has a garage door. And so that's usually a few degrees cooler. So I know it's going to be like really 62 instead of 65 where the concrete's right. being cured. So I know it's going to be cooler, right? What I, what I think is really important, and this is almost free. Okay. And I think this is essential for everybody to do, no matter where you are, is obviously you want to cover your pieces with plastic, right? Um, unless you're doing upright casting where you're going to, you know, trawl the surface and then cover it. There's absolutely no reason to do anything other than like drape your pieces with plastic. Just lay it on there. You understand the concrete, you're never going to see it. Who cares what it looks like, right? Um, yeah, and there is some argument for, you know, some sort of substrate under the plastic. But again, I think that's for upright casting primarily. That's for upright casting where you're wanting. And it, that goes back to, like, I used to teach a cast in place class in 2006 with Bob Harris of the Decorative Concrete Institute. And when you cure a troweled surface, you don't want anything touching, and you certainly don't want moisture droplets. That, that, that's going to, like, really discolor it. So um, we use curing blankets, which are commercial. It, it looks for all the world like a picnic tablecloth, you know, where it's a sheet of vinyl and the uh, underside is like, like yeah. felt, felt covered. But there's lots of different ways to get around that. Um, really, what you're trying to do is have a, an absorptive layer that draws any moisture that might collect and kind of create a humid Evenly blanket to spread the moisture out. So it softens its effect. And there's so lots of different that, ways to do that. You know, is that felt directly touching the concrete yeah, or is it kind of hovering? directly on the concrete. Um, and you want it to be that way because if you have an air gap, uh, right, then you get it'll a cure different. Area where it's... So you, you absolutely want, and again, this is only necessary if you're doing a trial surface or upright casting or whatever you want to call it. Um, yep. If you're doing inverted casting, how most people do it, it's a completely irrelevant step. Uh, it's not going to hurt anything, but you don't, certainly don't have to go do that. Um, right, right. So I cover it in plastic, um, and I just reuse the same stuff over and over again. I've had, I have the same sheet of plastic for years. It gets a tear mm -hmm. in it, put a little duct tape on it, whatever. Um, I, I, I went to Home Depot, and I bought some of that reflective um, radiant insulation. It looks like bubble wrapped mm -hmm. as silver, right? And again, it comes in a roll. You can reuse it over and over. So I lay some of that on top to help be a radiant reflector. And then, and this is, and those are like, that part's nice, right? You don't really need to do it. And it's not practical on really complex shapes. Like when we did some of the shapes in class, especially that big coffee bar, very three-dimensional, lots of open space, just really not practical for that. But what is really important is to cover it with some sort of insulation. So if you think of your concrete, just like, you laying in bed right it's going to be making its own heat uh through the chemical reactions and exothermic reaction it generates its own heat and right. you want to trap that heat as best as you can so the more blankets you pile on top of that the more it's going to trap the heat and it's not going to hurt anything right well yeah i mean so we were talking about uh the temperatures here so i cast mm -hmm. some things yesterday um, uh, five tabletops. It was the last, mm -hmm. last casting for that project in LA that actually is going to go out next week, early next week. Um, and you know, it was on the cold end of my heater cause you know, the, the flames at the far end. So that's right. really, really hot. And then it kind of, you know, tapers off. Um, and 
I had the heat set at 65 and the pieces were probably, I don't know, 98, 100 degrees when I walked in this morning. So, I mean, they, they did their thing. Everything was perfect. Uh, and that's and, uh, you know, part they were hard. of how you, know, you can, I, that's part of how you can overcome the, the effects of winter is just like, you know, if, if it's cold in your house and you're, you want to be warm, you cover up with something. You know, if you can't get your house warm enough or don't want to pay for it, you cover up and trap the heat that you're making. And that's, you know, you could do that in the summer too, right? Heat accelerates chemical reactions. Cold slows them down. Right. And blankets are, you can use them over. I mean, you you got wonderful things. You got to, where did you get your, those big green blankets you have? They were we cheap. have a true value, uh, like discount hardware store in town that sells all sorts of really strange things and, and all of it's like clearance stuff. So it's, it's just, it's an odd place to be in, but I got those, they're, uh, either queen or king. I can't remember what they're like mm-hmm. queen or king size comforters, uh, yeah. like duvets that are, I mean, they're quilted, uh, and they were like, they're ugly, but they were $6 a piece. Well, who cares what so, they I mean, look it's, like, it's, right? it's like buying, you know, three moving, moving blankets blank, for six bucks. It's yeah. awesome. Um, so I've got three of those. I need more, but, um, I went awesome. to a thrift store once and bought some really old, uh, like comforters from yeah. the 1980s. Like you don't have who to, cares? That, these, who cares what it looks like? I mean, and it doesn't have to be one big one. You can have lots of little ones as long as they overlap. Yeah, but, exactly. you know, be creative. The, the The only downside of that is they're bulky to store, right? So they get are. some of they those are. big plastic storage tubs. Totes. That's what I've got. Those big totes. And that, that's a great way. You fold them up, keep them in there. They stay relatively clean. They're out of the way. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that it, as a simple first tip, definitely – cover you plan you can't, for winter plan for winter uh and you know when it comes to sealers um and not just like omega but pretty much any sealer especially water-based sealers you need to keep your shop consistently above i'm going to say at least 50 to 50, 60 degrees 60 I'd degrees 60 Fahrenheit. minimum and and ideally closer to room temperature um yeah the yeah. The, the effects of not doing that could mean either you know, and this is but, this I is mean, not it's necessarily a three or four day cure them. on any on any yeah. water based urethane. If right. you don't, you know, if your shop's at fifty to forty degrees, I mean, it's yeah. going to take days. Whereas if your shop is at sixty five or seventy, seventy being ideal, um, you know, overnight's fine. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, I know when I was when I was developing Omega, one of the tests I wanted to look at was all right, what is the effective temperature? Because it, you know, is it pretty linear? Is it steep? And I actually sealed a piece and put it in a refrigerator, um, Mm -hmm. brand new. And I set the refrigerator to be as warm as possible. And I I might even prop the door open a little bit. So it it hovered around 50 degrees. I monitored the temperature. And it took like over a week before it got to a point where I was comfortable saying, okay, it's now on its way to cure. You could touch it. You could sand it. You could do whatever you wanted to it. Whereas if it was 70, 75 degrees, that, that would happen, you know, overnight, overnight or in a day and a half. So the, the effects yeah, I mean, of temperature I are very in important. the summer. I will seal and install the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can put like, even in the summer, <clears throat> what I've noticed is with the new um, application method uh, of the spraying, the primer. And then um, if you were to put like an infrared heat lamp on it, even in the summer, it is, it is amazing how much difference that makes. It's um, and the reason for that is um, not only are you pumping heat in to accelerate the reaction, but you're well, drying you're getting, moisture, getting out. moisture out. Yeah. And unlike some other sealers, Omega does not need moisture; it's just a carrier. In fact, you get better performance when the water evaporates from it quicker. And that's right. why the, you know this new priming method you're getting fantastic results. Less moisture because you're, less you're putting moisture. less moisture in the concrete. Yeah. Um, so let's move on from plan for What's winter, which is a list? concrete tip. Yeah. I want to move to a business tip. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> this is something I have been very vocal and passionate about. And I want to tell y'all it has gotten me work. Um, and that is don't rush. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I say this on my website and I, I may actually pull my website up and read the little blurb because 
I've had a handful uh, of clients over the last several years uh, since I did that. It's been about two years since I put that on the website. And I've probably had five or six jobs that came directly from a client calling me and saying, I really appreciate this. We're hiring you because of it. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's very simple. Um, I'm pulling up my website and, and it's, don't, it's, it's, I said this to a client a couple of weeks ago, if I am ever forced to choose between your timeline and, and my quality, I will never choose your timeline. Right. Um, and I think if that's an understanding that you're, if that's one of the expectations that you set, um, you know, people respect you and appreciate it. So my general kind of MO <clears throat> is that I put family first. My quality is the utmost uh, uh, <clears throat> standard by which I, you know, measure my uh, installations. Um, we don't compromise or cut corners and we have no urgency. So although things may be on a deadline or whatever, we, we don't, we try very, very hard to prepare our calendar, et cetera, so that even if we're on a deadline, those things don't creep up on us and get stressful because right. that's when you make mistakes. That's when, um, you know, things go haywire. That's when things, if you're routinely in the, in the, oh crap, I got to get this done right now. Um, that's when you're going to cut corners and that's when things are going to be subpar or not to your, your standards and you're going to get called out on it. Nothing um, ever good comes from rushing. Well, and the reality is no matter what the client tells you, they are not going to be ready when they say they need you. I mm -hmm. had a project recently, a uh, phenomenal builder, very respected, phenomenal designer, very respected. Um, and frankly, I was behind. Um, we had some communication issues that delayed the project. Uh, you know, I didn't get a color until later and then I had to match it and so forth and so on. Um, which, you know, is going to bring me to another business point, uh, which we'll address later, which is amend your contract often. Um, but you know, extenuating circumstances project was late and they were not happy about it to be totally frank on this podcast, they were not happy about it. However, um, same thing. I'm not going to comp compromise your quality for your timeline. I'm just not going to do it. It's not, it's not something I'm willing to do in this business because ultimately the, the sting of poor quality lasts far longer than the, the pain of lateness. Mm -hmm. Um, it just, uh, and so, you know, we get to the house, uh, beautiful spec home, um, and the staircase isn't finished and some of the flooring isn't finished and they're having drywallers come out for punch list stuff. That's not done. And I'm like, Oh, well, okay. That makes me feel better because I thought, Oh gosh, they're waiting on me. It's all me. They're right. waiting on me. Everything's horrible. And I get there and I'm like, Oh, there's like 18 trades that are still doing things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, landscaping hadn't been started yet and so forth and so on. You're, so, you're sensing their frustration of things yeah. in general being behind. Mm -hmm. And I feel you. it. I mean, and yeah. I, I empathize with it and I want to do everything I can. And you should too, right. to be, to be an advocate for them, be the, on their side and do everything you can to, to move things along. Um, you know, and, and it's hard because you want every client to feel like your own only client, even though they're not. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, in my personal experience over, over a decade, uh, compromising, you know, cutting a corner or rushing, whether that comes in the form of, you know, if you've got a family taken that weekend, I mean, and occasionally you got to do that, right? Like there are, I have pulled many all nighters. I have worked many a weekend, but as a rule, as a, a general modus operandi, I don't do that stuff because right. that's not when I am exhausted as an artisan, when I am drained when I am overworked, you, the client does not get my best. The client does not get my best product. Right. And that is what I'm trying to avoid because yeah, it's and just that's like not good for you or marriage or whatever. Right. It's like when you aren't, when your cup isn't full, the other people in your life suffer as a result of it. Yeah. And nothing, and so I again, just, nothing good comes of that either. 
Uh, and that's how you get burned out. If, if, if that's, if you find yourself consistently chasing projects, always rushing to meet a deadline that keeps moving and slipping and you got to reevaluate what's going on. And I'm going to, I'm going to interject a new tip. That's sort of a corollary to this new tip. Um, if you find that you are just struggling with all these projects, you've got too many projects because raise your you have prices. to have a lot of raise your prices. Exactly. If you have too many projects or you have to take on so many projects just to pay the bills, what that's telling me, and this, this is borne out by looking at in 20 years of my colleagues, my students, and other people in the industry, the successful people raise their prices consistently, regularly, regularly. Um, because what ha two things happen. You do less work for the same amount of money because you're getting paid more, but even better, you get better clients because they value your product and they respect your time. Absolutely. The people that are looking that the only thing that matters is how, you know, how cheap can you do it? Yeah. Well, and this is a, this is a, a kind of getting into it, at least in the United States of America. I am a, a hard advocate for if you're not at least $135 a square foot for your bargain basement, yeah. inch and a half thick countertops, you're not expensive enough. Well, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago or several episodes ago about a rough like dollar per square foot cost of everything, including labor. And we came up to what, $45, $50? Well, and right? I do want to clarify that. Somebody actually texted me night before last. Uh, about that same thing. And I had to clarify. So I want to put this out there. We were referring specifically to a square foot at uh, uh, three quarters of an inch thick. Yes. Um, so, you know, and, and, and a lot of that is like, you know, I have done my best to sharpen my pencil with 11 years of experience of knowing what things cost. We've got a very specific breakdown in the mix design that tells me what all my ingredients cost. So I know what my square foot cost is on the materials, the labor, because we do things that we don't always do, you know, it's mm -hmm. not like I'm making the same table 300 times in a row. Right. I'm making 15 different tables, 15 different times. And so there's an element of, I never know exactly until it's mm -hmm. done, but because we've got the experience, we can hone in on right. what that profit margin is going to be pretty darn close. Um, and so there's some approximation there. Uh, and I do want to clarify that that wasn't like because of all the custom, the custom nature of our work, it's not an exact science, but it, it's, it's very close. Yeah. If you've got uh, to make, if you have a production mold, like you're going to make a bathtub or a, a sink vanity and the mold's already done, like the whole thing, it's up on the shelf. Profit in your pocket. You pull it down. It's already assembled. All you have to do is clean it, put some release on it if, if necessary and then cast, right? So you might have half an hour's worth of labor in the whole prep. That's that's entirely different from, you know, building really complex inner molds and outer molds and having to do bracing because you're doing direct casting of a vertical deep mold. And you've got to go get those ingredients and maybe you have to buy some new tools or equipment to do that. It's like you said, it's so all over the place it's hard to predict and so you know we're, we're kind of generalizing here just always take everything with a grain of salt and understand that there's no way to give exact numbers for every scenario but on average yeah you're by your and large kind of on high. average you know yeah your yeah. your your costs are high to produce our product and well i mean and, and with that in mind i mean we I, I, we talked about uh, last week we talked about a, a an artisan that that both of us know um, who unfortunately, I mean, he was talented, but unfortunately is out of the game now. Um, and he told me one time when he was in business, he was like, man, I can't, I can't get above 55, 60 bucks a square foot. And I was like, my man, you are, you're running hard towards out of business yeah. because you can't, that's not sustainable. I mean, if you're making five bucks a square foot and that's your profit, and, and, no, thank you. Why do it? I mean, one, one little miscalculation and you're already losing money. Um, mm -hmm. You're but, spending money to get a product in your client's right. home, and that's just the, the flip side of also, or another aspect of this is the people that you really want to be selling to, the people who you really want to be your clients. 
they don't, don't care about the even look at a product if it's too inexpensive. Correct. Like if if I'm in the if I put myself in a in, in a client's shoes and I say, all right, I want, for instance, a handmade, beautiful walnut dining room table. Right. I want it to be exactly what I want. Maybe I want the legs carved. I want, you know, it to be live edge slab, whatever. You know, you're probably looking at ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, right? Would I even consider looking at IKEA? or Walmart, or Target, or any of these big big box like Room to Go or whatever. Like, I don't think you'd even look at Restoration product. Hardware. I mean, it's just right, a different or thing. Restoration Hardware. I'm not even going to think about looking at that. And if they approached me, I would just brush them off. So if you are in that mentality where you have to... If you're trying to compete with the other track... natural stones in this, in this world, you're, yeah. you know, it's just... It, I, because it's handmade artisan material it's it's kind of like um it's kind of like sticking the word wedding in front of the word cake right that thing becomes yeah. exponentially more expensive mm -hmm. or you, go to, you, you know, go to a grocery store and buy a cake even go to like whole foods all right maybe you're gonna pay what 30 40 bucks for something i don't know yeah I've and then you go buy a wedding there. cake and it's 600 dollars. right yeah just because realistically it's... the same type of product but it's different and, right. and that's what we're getting at is, is we don't offer cake. We offer wedding cake. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? We, we don't offer, uh, you know, a drive through car wash. We offer a hand polished, detail. Yeah. you know, detail. We, and that's the kind of mentality that we hope that you will gain from this, mm -hmm. um, from it. And, and so moving on, I kind of want to flip back and forth, right? We did yep, concrete, yep. then like business. That. We'll go back to concrete. Um, I want to, uh, touch real fast on, um, alpha admix because uh, several people have asked me about my recipes for SCC versus hand pressed uh, or hand pack, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to just offer that information to you. Um, if that's all right, I think that's yeah. uh, valuable. And it, none uh, of this is of any secret or, or oh, anything well like done. that. It's just no, no, but it's nice to put it out there. Um, so right. we operate on percentages. Jeff, you may have the poundages. I don't know. Um, I am a very, well, very big and vocal advocate for, and you could probably put it in a spreadsheet, uh, but vocal advocate for percentages simply because that's how you get most accurate. CCI well, that, has the most accurate calculator on the market. That's what um, the concrete industry works on. Like that's the <laughs> industry standard, the technical industry standard. It's right. scalable, right? Hundred grams. Right. To 10, so what I am pounds. not about to do is say you need fifty grams of this and forty grams of this and a pound of this. No, right? Because that's not scalable. It's not translatable to what you do unless you go do a bunch of math, um, and then maybe right. Um, so for SCC, which is most of what I do, um, I'm using an Imer one hundred and twenty Mortarman, um, fantastic little mixer. Um, and my water cement ratio is at 0.3. My fluidizer, specifically fluidizer, this would not be the same with 310 or uh, another plasticizer on the market. This is a powder You'd plasticizer. You'd probably have to use fluidizer. a lot more. Yeah. Double, probably. Um, fluidizer is okay. phenomenally powerful. But I'm at a 0.45 fluidizer. Um, and that's calculated just like pigment. Um, I, I mix that. So once everything's incorporated, that gets mixed for a minimum of a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and that lets the fluidizer disperse and activate. Um, and you'll, you'll watch it. It'll be kind of crunchy and powdery, and then it'll be kind of non-Newtonian. And then suddenly it's magical. That, that's, um, a, that's a well-known necessary step in making UHPC and, and polycarboxylates in general is is they have to disperse. It takes time to mechanically start breaking, moving things apart. Uh, yep. But it happens fast. It does. I mean, a minute and a half is, I mean, it's, it's fun to watch. I need to film a yeah. video of it. But, um, and then what I do is I turn the mixer off. This is before fibers. I turn the mixer off and I let the mix burn. Yeah. Um, you know, we've talked a ton about dense concrete. Um, and no matter what mixer you use, whether it's small, large, fast, or slow, you're going to whip air into your concrete. Um, it's inevitable. Part of the, you know, part of the SCC thing 
self-consolidating thing is that it's liquid enough that it's going to let bubbles out. Um, but that is far easier to do in, in the mixer than it is. It's not going to happen in the form very effectively. So, um, I let the mixer or I let the mix burp for about five minutes and then I fold in my fibers. Um, you can use a pencil vibrator if you don't want to wait that long. Um, but, but it, uh, the risk, the risk of using a vibrator in your mixer, if the mix is, if you, it, you could segregate the mix sure. in, a, in a small location. So you have to be careful. Yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, you got to be careful about that. Um, Cause again, you know, that plastic. But here, here's powerful. the thing about like mixes that make you not make, suggest that you let a, a, a mix sit for a while. And I've heard some other words for it. All that's happening is the air is coming out. It's that's perfect. what it is. It's burping. We call it burping because that's what's happening. It's just like, all right. Well, you, there's you a term going a around beer, that's not get... technically correct, but, and what's we that? are technical. There's a term going around for this that's not tech. I mean, it's right. kind of like saying uh, hydraulic versus hydrostatic pressure. The technically correct term is hydrostatic pressure, not hydraulic, yeah. because you're not exerting force upon it. Correct. But you're communicating the message either way. Yeah, right? the, the, the point um, is you let it sit and then the air comes out. And if that's important to you, um, then fine. But like when we yeah. cast those big uh, panels for the uh, fireplace around, mm -hmm. we didn't really let it sit that long. Yeah, a minute or two. A I mean, minute or two. Was... And the reason why we didn't have to is as we were casting it, we were we had our hands in there and we're kind of massaging it helping yeah, to release the it's air less critical in a, in a, uh, thin application. Those things were yeah, seven, big open, thick. open pan. And so like, I've got tables right now that have a concave convex. I don't know. Uh, the, the bottom edge is rounded over and I'm casting mm -hmm. into that. So, you know, I want to get as much air out as sure. possible first. So I don't have those pinholes mm -hmm. on the bottom edge and I haven't, which is great. Um, and then moving to hand packed, not hand pressed, this would be less, but hand packed, like you can, I'm going to call it like miracle whip, more, flu not fluid, but more softer than peanut butter, but not, you know, Play-Doh, um, uh, a little less than Play-Doh. I think miracle whip really, um, not everybody knows what that is. Well, mayonnaise. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a mayonnaise yeah. like dressing mayonnaise like substance i guess we could yeah. go with mayonnaise it's a little thicker than mayonnaise but anyway uh hand packed creamy um, mashed potatoes you know, yes that's it that's what i'm going for uh, creamy we mashed are potatoes. all about the food recipe here so i'm going for creamy mashed potatoes so that's going to yeah. produce intentionally mind you voids that are probably a quarter of an inch give or take yeah. um pretty shallow a quarter of an inch um and what I have done, and it has worked phenomenally well every single time. In fact, I just uh, gave this exact uh, formula to Dylan Myers, and he was he texted me later. And he was like, "That was amazing." Yeah. Um, it's 0. 0.32 water cement ratio, no fluidizer because it will. The other thing about fluidizer is that stuff lasts and lasts and lasts. You put fluidizer in it, it's gonna slump for two hours. It's called persistence. It is and that's what phenomenally it's, it's, persistent. It's, a good, it's what it's, it's for. It's good for when you want to make very fluid concrete, which that's what it was made to do. Yeah. You want that. So my current choice, although, um, you know, others of you may use other things, uh, but I do a 0. 0.32 water cement ratio, no fluidizer, and I tune with uh, WC420 from SmoothOn currently. Yeah. Um, Except it's a liquid superplasticizer. When, when did that happen? I got half a gallon left. Yeah, that's it. I am working ah! on a sub I'm working on a replacement for that, so that'll be coming. Hurry! Soon. <laughs> no. ah, what yeah. do I do in the meantime? Um, but okay, so 420 or similar. Yeah. Um, 555 would probably work. It's an Adva product, so Adva is a uh, Adva 190. If that's still available, was one I really liked. Um, so Adva makes a, a few that are that are great. Yeah. Most, uh, most big chemical uh, admixture companies, Euclid, Sika, BASF, um, Grace, all have variations of liquid superplasticizers that do that. So, yep. 
So, but tuned with a liquid, they're less powerful and uh, they also are less persistent. So, um, you know, I, I was able to do these bases. Um, we've got 21 bases in the shop right now. Well, 22, because I had an, I just did an extra one. Um, but uh, we were able to lay up vertical one inch thick, just <laughs> all the way up 36 inches. It's awesome. Or 32 inches. Um, so that's my recommendation for uh, hand packed. Um, again, same in the Eimer, folding the fibers at the very end. So that's, uh, that's that tip. So that's, you know, so, so far we've got plan for winter. We've got don't rush. We've got SCC and, uh, hand packed recipes. And we'll go back to the business side. Yeah. Um, uh, Jeff, this is something that I have, uh, talked about with you a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. is amending your contract at least once a year. At least, um, yeah. At least. I often will do it after a job where something has gone awry that I didn't see coming and didn't like. And I'm like, I did that. that's going in the contract. There'd be the clause <laughs> that, that would, we'd, we'd informally and jokingly name each clause name after the, clause. the client that yeah. created the reason <laughs> for putting it in there. Yeah. So I've got a clause right now. Um, and I'm not going to name the, the client, but I've got a clause in there now that says don't leave. And, and this is it's much more legally worded than this, but it says don't leave your stuff outside in the crate. I had a client leave for weeks, for weeks, 90 days, three months, three, three months. months. They, they're they like, this was a rush project, by the way. It was a rush project. I did three vanities. I sealed them. I threw them in the crates and I sent them. And I'm like, all right, well, these will be installed next week. No, yeah, because they're <laughs> they in a hurry. Them. <laughs> they were in a hurry. They left them outside in an OSB crate with no covering. Well, it was like a lean to, but it was Florida and it rained sideways in Florida. It's like, are you kidding me? Why would you do this? So anyway, now I have that clause. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, in the con in, I'm in the contract with each, each um, new issue that arises. So that was one instance um, I actually have. And this is maybe something you want to do. I've actually for 2024, I've added blackout dates to my contract. Mm -hmm. um, so as soon as I know that I've got, a, you know, we've got a class coming up or um, I've scheduled a vacation with my family or uh, what, whatever the case may be, I am sticking those blackout dates in my contract for 2024 mm -hmm. Um, and so there's no surprises. The client knows, you know what, February 12th through 16th, you're not going to get anything from me. Yep. Um, and you know, again, that goes back to setting expectations, but I think getting this specific with it is really, really important. Um, you know, your contract is a living document. It's not a one and done. Um, and it's phenomenally important. I got screwed over so many times because I didn't have a contract. Um, and, and, you know, I was really, stubborn took me several years after attending cci to actually implement the contract um and now i'm anal about it it's like if i don't have a deposit and a signed contract you are not in my calendar and yeah. if i don't have a final payment you're not getting your product it's just that's just the way it is um and i think that that is it, it is it protects me it protects the client mm -hmm. um it's just it's just the smart thing to do. I mean, I get the I get the desire to operate on a handshake, but it's just that's not the world. It's not works. how the world works. I was at a, a big event about seven years ago, eight years ago now, and there was several roundtable discussions. And one of the roundtable discussions was contract, and and it was to me um, there there were like two thirds of the people who were in this roundtable. There were probably like twenty people. Um, we're kind of smaller fabricators, smaller makers. And then about a third were pretty big, you know, we're t a couple of these guys were, you know, big national type fa factories, we'll call them. They, they're, they're in, they're, their influence is national um, in terms of their market. And mm -hmm. uh, well-respected, been doing this for a long, long time. And there was a pretty clear divide between the minority of the people who actually use contracts and were very strong proponents for it, like, like you and I are. 
And then mm -hmm. the large majority of the smaller, relatively new craftspeople who some of them were very adamant about not using one and their logic behind it was, dare I say, kind of naive. You know, they, they true in their hearts, they wanted to do the, you know, the handshake, honorable things like that. But the reality of it is, is that you have to have documentation to protect yourself as well as your customer. Um, because ultimately, when things go sideways, how and do you resolve will. that? Yeah. You go to court. And if mm -hmm. you don't have documentation, you automatically lose. Well, so and that, that is a, a kind of... You don't a, want to go uh, there, but it's always thinking about dotting that I and making sure that I is never going to happen, never going to happen for one. But if it does, yes. it's, you're, you're, you, you know, you, you've got yourself covered. Well, it's like point four B, uh, mm -hmm. document everything. And I mean, that goes down to, you know, if it's on the phone, you know, text messages are admissible in court now. So uh, I believe, I mean, it's phone records. Um, they should be. Yeah. I mean, they yeah, should they be. Are. It's a, it's a text writing. record of something, right? So yeah. have it in writing. If you have a conversation on the phone, text or email the client and be like, this is what we talked about. Yeah. Um, because that becomes an amendment. And that's one thing I actually, uh, put in my contract is that, you know, text or email communications become an amendment to this contract. Mm -hmm. Just like templates um, become are part of the contract. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there are physical representations, the contract, uh, and, and there's a lot of, uh, there's so many things you can put in. I mean, my contract's what, eight pages, and I think it could yeah. be a lot longer. Um, so that's that horse beat, I yeah. suppose. And we make, um, of course, when you come to class, you have access to both contract and then contract you, and share, contract. you share your contract. So it's, it's basically, you, you get a working document that has a long evolution of refinement. Yeah, yeah. And of course we always, always say have your lawyer who's familiar with your local business laws and business practices, take a look at it, make tweak it, change it, do whatever. So it's appropriate for you. You know, you can't just generically take a contract from out of the ether and use it and, and be right. confident that it's going to be completely applic applicable to you. Um, right, right. But you know, just be sensible about that. Yeah. Um, so next one, this is a scientific one. So Jeff, you're taking this one all the way. Um, okay. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, casting powder. Um, casting. Oh yeah. We've done a, a lot magical of powdered unicorn dust. Yeah. Baking soda. Yeah. <laughs> Largely. Yeah. That's, that's Largely a very, baking soda. so I don't know what so, it was for me. Like yeah. I learned about using baking soda probably in the early 2000s. I had a I had a class, and one of the one of the people who came um, used to do cast stone or did cast stone or came from the cast stone industry. And if if you're not familiar with that, that's basically making um, things out of concrete, right? But it's not concrete. Like you pour it. Stone kind of thing. It's yeah, balusters and fountains and stuff like that. It's basically a dry pack form of concrete and the end result looks like limestone. So it's usually hammered into a form and compacted and and then it can be demolded quickly. But one of the one of the uh visual effects they they would use for texture would be to um put baking soda in the forms and it would give it kind of a limestone uh, uh fossilized coral or whatever. Yep look right so it's a very very old school technique of using a baking soda and then there have been variations of that like we have our own variation of but it's basically baking soda is, is the quote the active ingredient and yeah i was curious to see because if you like if you take and what we've done this too i'm jumping all over the place because my mind's going like well, i gotta talk about this and i gotta talk about that um like if you're making your concrete and, and you have a bucket of concrete and you accidentally put a little bit too much super plasticizer into it um one thing we sometimes do is we'll sprinkle a little, little baking soda into the concrete to stiffen it back up and it can be pretty effective you and gotta be careful because it's an accelerator too, too so right? so not only is it a viscosity modifier but it's an accelerator so right well that's why it's a viscosity modifier because it's accelerating and i, I wanted to know why that was happening um 
And it turns out there's several research papers I found on the inter internet, and it and it is an accelerator. And what what's what it's doing is it's generating um, calcium carbonate and edergite, which is a needle-like formation that occurs in concrete. And I'm not going to get in the chemistry of it or anything like that, but it, it can happen quite quickly. Um, usually, like for what we've seen, a few minutes. Like it'll 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 take concrete that is just wet, you know, to use the very loose in and in incorrect terminology, way too wet, and mm -hmm. turn it into something way too dry and crumbly, mm -hmm. um, almost too fast. So, it when you broadcast baking soda in your forms and you're pouring over that, it kind of stiffens up the concrete where it touches, and because there is a chemical reaction going on, that that. Uh, the, the sodium starts interacting with the hydroxides in the concrete and then the carbonate starts working on and you're starting to form and precipitate different chemical compounds in the concrete itself that sometimes either wouldn't occur at all or would occur until way later. Uh, you sometimes get a f not just a physical but a visual difference. It could cure a little lighter or a little different. Yeah, it so does. It does. You're going to notice that I've seen that you've seen that other people and it's it's extremely apparent in gray cement based concrete, uh, mm -hmm. very very apparent, and um, this all has to do with it's it's not just drawing the concrete out; it's actually uh, chemically interacting with the concrete. Um, it's not a detrimental thing. Um, the mechanisms are still not well or completely understood because di different doses in one of the research papers, they were actually blending baking soda and other carbonate type materials into the concrete before they actually added water to it oh, to study its effects, like heat generation, strength, porosity, as well as the microscopic, what's going on chemically and different things happen at different doses. So, but when we well, and I would posit, I don't actually know this, but I would, I would posit that um, an extreme dose would actually lower your strength. So, you know, because... yeah, yeah, yeah. You you can't go too nuts on this, um, and it's not there to boost the strength um, so much as to accelerate its hardening. You know, when it yeah. is no longer liquid, and that's kind of yeah. the where the rubber meets the road that's how we use it is so that we yep. get that sort of stone like effect and that's why it's happening and that's why you just can't take anything you know just a powder like or fine sand or something like that and, and get the kind of same results because it's not interacting chemically so that's right, kind right. of the long and the short of it of why it's why it does that and it's it's kind of a really versatile it's a lot of fun. i mean I use it a ton, a ton, a ton. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'll mix pigment into it. Sometimes I'll mm -hmm. make a, you know, so there's a lot or, or mica flakes or, I mean, there's a lot of fun things yeah. you can do with it um, that really augment the visual texture of the pieces. Um, so that would be tip number five. We got two left. Two um, left, yep. Yeah. Two left. So we're going back over to business. Um, and this is one that I uh, actually got from Jason Johnston. Um, in uh, Quebec, um, and he uses a laser template company to save the business time. Um, and I've started doing this. Um, I've got, as you may know, I have jobs uh, all over the place, and it is a phenomenally helpful service. Um, you know, the way I've done it is I've gone and I've found um, local to my project uh, large stone fabricators um, and eight times out of ten they will have a guy or a machine um, with a guy uh, in their shop that templates with a laser mm -hmm. um, very very accurate you get CAD plans um, and so in my area uh, it, it, it has cost about five hundred dollars a time which is generally what I charge for template anyway so the clients paying for it I don't have to leave my shop and I get a very accurate set of field measurements and plans um, and it has served me phenomenally well because you get all of the information, you get cabinet centers, you get, you know, uh, how is the wall you get? I mean, and it is, it is so, so, so unbelievably helpful. Um, right. 
you know, it's, this is how stone companies template. Uh, and, and the laser template software and, and machinery is like $30,000. So it's, it's not a low cost of entry thing, but paying $500 to have your, your stuff templated is very low cost of entry in my personal opinion. Right. Uh, and I am a huge fan of it in my own business. Yeah, I, I learned about laser templating. Gosh, 2000, around 2009 i can't remember what year it was and i was actually trying to look into old class photos to see if i this this one gentleman he was um he was part of isfa the international solid surface fabricators association he and another gentleman came to class and uh because they wanted to you know learn about concrete you, see, you know solid surfaces you know corian is the, the the first name brand solid surface that came on the market in the in the 70s or maybe it was earlier than that. I can't remember, but um, he was telling me how you know they do everything laser templating, and and I don't know if it's still in, but there was a company in Raleigh that it was e templates that that made the equipment for it. It is expensive, I believe, right? yeah. But yeah, most yeah. like granite shops who have CNC machines, you know, they'll go out and template and email the template to the shop, and and then the CNC machine's cutting the stone out before the they even get back potentially right yeah. there's no delay um in practice i'm sure it's not exactly the same day but it theoretically could be um it's you're you're basically just scanning a three-dimensional sh space and it's it's if you're using a good system and you're using it correctly it's very very accurate and like you like we mentioned before it becomes part of the contract so if the job site changes and i've, I've had this in this part of the contract um you go to template, whether you digitally template or you physically template with the old stick and, you know, whether it's strips of door skin or Luon or the corrugated plastic or whatever you want to use, right? You have a physical representation of the job site. And that's the function of a template is you can take that template back to your shop and you have an accurate representation. You, you capture the geometry. It's not just length, it's angles and things like that. Yeah, exactly. If in between templating and installation, something happens to the job, cabinets get disassembled, they, cab they get moved, something gets damaged, they add to it, they subtract from it, and you, you come in and install your concrete, and all of a sudden the concrete either doesn't fit or is the wrong sh size because the job, you know, the cabinets grew or shrunk, you have something to stand back and say, you know what? One, I didn't screw up because my mm -hmm. templates were made on the job site. And here's another tip, sub tip, always take lots of photos of the job site, especially Absolutely. your templates on the cabinets. Um, and, you know, if they decide, well, you, you said you were gonna do the uh, powder room, but you're only gonna do the kitchen. Well, it's not in the contract and it's not in the template. So no, we weren't doing the powder room. Um, your templates are very, very important uh, element of your contract of, of your business yes, and i absolutely. like i don't do physical i don't do laser template but what i would what i would always do on installation is before you ever take a piece of concrete off the truck is you go into the job site and first look at template. it make sure it's clean and then you put your templates on and you install the templates to make sure make nothing sure has changed right that's that's like your final check because once you start moving concrete a a it's you know tedious and B, once you start installing something, you can't take it back out. It becomes part exactly. of the job site and you cannot remove it legally. Exactly. So yeah, templating, it's, it, laser templating is, that's really smart, especially if you're doing a remote job, like you, you do a lot yeah. of work in Florida, but even if it's the next town over, yeah. to, to get in your truck and drive over there and spend an hour or two templating or, yep. or more, mm -hmm. is uh, you could be doing something else in that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, final tip of the day. Uh, this is more of a trick than a tip. Mm -hmm. Um, is, uh, sealers for enhancing and sheen. We offer yeah. two sealers, as you may know, uh, Ovation and Omega. Ovation is designed, um, as our kind of DIY sealers. Phenomenally easy to apply. It's very hard to mess up and it's more protective than Jeff and I give it credit for. Um, 
but it does not enhance your uh, your color. So if you like the raw look of your concrete, the raw color of your concrete, um, our, both of our sealers are compatible and you can use Ovation to prime before Omega so that you don't color enhance the concrete. Mm -hmm. um, conversely, if you don't need the pro level protection of Omega, um, say for a wall panel, but you do want to enhance the color, you can prime with Omega and finish with Ovation. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, if you want to augment the sheen of Omega, you can fully, fully seal with Omega as usual and stick gloss ovation over the top of it to augment the sheen. Yeah. Um, so these are fully compatible sealers. The chemistries are compatible. Um, they are uh, designed to, to, to work together, um, and they're designed to be applied the same way. So we've tried to make it they're, really easy on you. They're applied exactly the same way. Um, I have ovation when I was developing it. One of the tests was I made a bird bath, concrete bird bath. It's in my front yard. It's completely sealed with ovation. And I don't know how many years old it is, four or five years old now. I mean, sure, the bird bath is dirty, but absolutely nothing's bad happened to the sealer at all. It does yeah. not peel off, right? No, no. no. Um, sticks like crazy. Um, and, and it's, it's very, very really hard to stain, too. Things... Um, I, I have it in a kitchen at my house. Yeah, white uh, kitchen. And... Yeah. And I mean, I've spilled mustard on it. I've, you know, I mean, it's, it's held up great. Yeah. I didn't expect I, it to. I mean, that was the thing. Jeff, Jeff kind of did this whole, uh, under promise over deliver thing because he was like, Oh, you know, it's not really designed for this. It's not... And I used it for it. Cause I was like, well, let's just see what it'll do. <laughs> and it's worked great. Um, right. you know, am I going to put it in a client's kitchen? No, I'm not. It's just, you know, because it's not what it's designed for. And I have Omega, but perfect for I a bathroom. Not a... I am not afraid to use it on a bathroom. Right. Perfect for shower walls, wall panels, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, Absolutely. You know, it it's could, fast. It's it, it dries fast. Yeah. So, you know, you can touch it five minutes, minutes later. later. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's your seven tips and tricks to improve your game in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to improve it even more, we, of course, recommend that you use Alpha Pro, uh, AdMix, and materials in general. Um, and if you want to improve it the most, we want to see you in one of our classes. Absolutely. Um, we've got workshops this year. We've got February coming up soon. Um, 8th and 9th is GFRC. 12 through 16 is Ultimate. And then uh, mm -hmm. Jeff and I are going to be talking, hopefully, this week to nail down future dates for the rest of the year. Oh, wow. I've got balloons. How does that I, happen? I don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know. I I kind of love that it happens, but it's 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 a total mystery to me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Is it going to do it? Oh, we got yeah, fireworks Yeah, there you now. go. Look at that. Does it do it for me? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't happen uh, for maybe, me. Maybe it's a Mac thing. I don't know. It must uh, be a Mac thing, I, yeah. I think it's hysterical. Um. So with the fireworks, uh, we hope that you enjoyed our seven tips and tricks, seven plus, because we've seven got a couple of A's and B's in there. Um, seven plus tips and tricks to be more successful in 2024. Um, hope you'll join us in future podcasts and future uh, workshops here in Canton. Yeah, definitely. And beyond. Sounds so. good. Till next week. have a great Are week, everybody. Well, next, next week, yeah. I mean, we, we should be able to have time before class to do that, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, awesome. Alrighty, we'll chat. All right, take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Maker in the Mix podcast. If you liked the content and want to hear more, please like and subscribe. Uh, feel free to follow us on YouTube as well as Instagram, Facebook, and check out the website www.concretecountertopinstitute.com. And of course, we'd love to see you at one of our upcoming classes. Tune in next week for more informative content. Thanks.